Hello everyone, I am here to guest lecture on a couple different topics for Morgan and today we're going to cover equine vaccinations. So I um, just wanted to give you a little bit of information about me. So I'm currently a third year veterinary student at Ross University School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, I studied my undergrad at the University of Tennessee at Martin and finished up my last classes at Tarleton State University <clears throat> soon after I did an internship after at the Four Sixes Ranch. Um, I also have owned horses my entire life and have been a mixed animal veterinary technician for 11 years. So I've got a lot of experience in this topic of vaccines and also parasite management. Um, if you have any questions regarding any of the lectures, I've listed my email address below. So if you have any questions, just shoot me over an email. Otherwise, just get in touch with Morgan and we'll go from there. So um, to get started, let's talk about the principles of vaccination. So kind of why do we want to do this? So we need to assess like the risk of disease, consequences of disease, effectiveness, also take into effect adverse reactions, the cost of immunization versus the cost of the disease. So whenever we're talking about the risk of disease, are we in an area where this is endemic? So uh, meaning, is it very current that you get the disease, things like that, that they have vaccines for? Um, the consequences of a disease, is it going to be fatal or is it just going to cause them to have a cold or something like that that you can treat with antibiotics? Again, we want to take into consideration that we don't want to use antibiotics just for antibiotic resistance purposes and things like that. Um, also, the effectiveness of a disease, I mean, of a vaccine. So whenever you have a, a vaccine, I know there's lots of controversy on strangles, for, for example. So lots of people think that it's kind of a waste of time, doesn't really work. I've also been in situations where we had a whole barn run through with strangles, and it was very effective for them to use the vaccine for new horses that came in. So it all just depends on your situation. As far as adverse reactions, if you know you have a horse that has a history of severe reactions to a vaccine, you know that you may not want to give that. Um, then again, is it worth it to do the reactions as opposed to um, the horse potentially dying of that disease? So you have to take that in consideration. Also, the cost of immunization plus the cost of disease. So kind of everything we've talked about there. Um, is it worth it for a $26 vaccine or is it worth it to have $550 in veterinary bills to have the animal healed or potentially cured or are you going to get full um, gaining of being able to perform with that animal again or what the animal's purpose is. So other things to consider about vaccines is the protection is not always equal. So although you may give the vaccine to your five horses that are out there in the pasture and one still may come down with it. Same thing with the flu vaccine in people, you know, every strain is different and things like that. And some horses get it in more severity than others. Um, protection is not immediate. So once you give this vaccine, if you decide that you'd want to go to a horse show or something, give the vaccine that day, it's not going to immediately start working. So you need to take that into effect as well and think about that before you go anywhere. Um, also, control and prevention is key. So here, the main reason and purpose for vaccines is that we either mainly want to prevent a disease from either spreading or getting into your herd or things like that, but you also want to control it. So some of these diseases we are going to talk about some that are zoonotic. So whenever people can get them as well. So you want to control that. And if you have horses or other things like that in an area that are continually getting it, you want to control it and keep it in that area. So a little bit about how vaccines work for those of you that don't know. So first we're going to inject um, antigens that are introduced into the body. So then this goes into the body's response by producing antibodies to the antigen. This protects the horse. Then three, the horse will get naturally exposed. So to a virus or something like that. So in this picture, they're showing a mosquito biting the horse, potentially giving it a virus, and it's gonna naturally expose it. And the antibodies are already gonna be in there. So the body's gonna to know to fight back on this disease. So factors affecting vaccination. So there are tons of factors affecting vaccination. I have just a lot of the main ones here um, that we're going to look at today. So exposure. So if you have your horses in a boarding facility, you're taking them to a show, you're exposing them to multiple other horses, different areas. Um, if you're traveling across state, you're exposing them to different things. Um, also resistance. So whenever you have um, a resistance issue to an area, generally this more applies to uh, parasitism, but you know, um, it is a factor with vaccines as well. Increased population density. So you have, um, again, for a boarding example, 
uh, you have tons of horses in a small little area, you're increasing your chances of one of these horses bringing in something to the entire population. Um, again, movement of horses on and off the facility, so horse shows, just going down the road to a trail ride, etc. All these things just to expose your animal. And then also environmental and managerial influences. So if you have um, environmental issues such as poor management around the barn with manure and keeping flies and things around, introducing water that um, is problematic for mosquitoes, breeding ground, things like that, um, you're just exposing them to uh, the potential to get something. Also, things that take into effect potentially for the horse directly is going to be stress, um, parasites, poor nutrition, sanitation um, from people and animals. So you have wildlife that comes in there. You have possums that are peeing on your uh, hay or getting into your feed, different things like that. Equipment coming in from other horse barns. So say you borrow a tractor, say they have something that's going on. Um, strangles again, for example, is um, on fomite objects, so inanimate objects, so such as the tractor and they drive on your farm and all of a sudden you get an outbreak of strangles throughout the um, farm that you're at. Um, going back to the stress aspect, this can go from anything back to movement of horses or weaning, so think about it in all life stages that we have stress. And for parasites, um, this can cause them to be anemic, so um, and other abnormalities with their normal system, so causing that can cause them to be susceptible to getting these viruses or other things more readily. So for different types of vaccines, I'm not going to go into depth on this because it can get pretty complex. Um, just kind of want to give you an idea that it's not just every vaccine's the same. Um, so there are live vaccines, modified live vaccines, recombinant vaccines. Under recombinant, there's live attenuated vectors. Um, there's chimeric DNA. There's also inactivated and killed pathogens. There's protein vaccines and recombinant subunit and adjuvants. So I'll talk about them just a little bit, just so you kind of have an idea about things. Um, so, you know, your killed and inactivated vaccine, that's going to be a dead pathogen. It's inactivated. Um, as far as your subunit vaccines, um, this you're going to take a, pa a pathogen, you're going to fraction it out, and then you have subunits of that vaccine. I like to think of it as uh, kind of a pop gun versus a real gun situation. So you have the virus that's a real gun, has potential to kill the animal, but a subunit vaccine is just a piece of that. So although it has the, it seems to have the effect of an actual virus, um, it's just a pop gun. It's not gonna actually kill or do anything to the animal except cause an immune response. Um, as far as DNA uh, vaccines, those all have to do with cloning. So we're going to clone the pathogen. And there are, again, subunit portions of this that you can take. So there's also protein vaccines that can come off of this as well. Um, it's very complicated, so I won't get too much into it. Just kind of know that it's kind of a cloning of the pathogen kind of situation. Um, as far as recombinant, um, it can come off of cloning and that DNA of the pathogen and can cause um, expression of certain aspects of the virus that you want to get an immune response to. Um, attenuation <clears throat> is uh, just an attenuation of the pathogen. So, um, and a live one is the full live version of the pathogen. So this has full effect to become the actual virus again. Again, um, not really, in most cases, not going to happen, but in some cases um, it is potential. So always be careful whenever you choose to use a live vaccine. Also other things to consider. So your live organisms, um, you, it's going to have fewer doses that are required um, because your immune response is going to respond quickly. Adjuvants are unnecessary um, and they have a less chance of hypersensitivity. Smaller doses are generally needed and they're usually done by a natural route and stimulate both the humoral and the cell-mediated response. And they usually last longer. While the non-living vaccines remain stable in storage, so this is definitely a, um, a good thing. So most of your live vaccines you have to mix. Once you mix them, they're only good for a certain brand of time. And your non-living vaccines, usually they're already mixed and can last for a very long time. Um, your non-living are unlikely to cause a disease again. Um, which we talked about, they're different. It's not subunits of the vaccines, you know, actually the killed pathogen. Um, they don't replicate in the recipient and they won't spread to other animals. 
It's also safe in the immunodeficient patients, so also something to consider whenever you have a horse that has immunodeficiency disease. <clears throat> and then lastly, just to touch on the adjuvants here. So they're just substances that facilitate or enhance the immune response to an antigen um, with which it's combined. So if it's combined with the pathogen or something like that, then it's just going to help increase that immune response. So for adverse reactions, um, there are acute and severe. So we kind of want to take into effect here on whether we want to give the vaccine or not to your horse. So for acute, you're going to have some muscular swelling or soreness, potentially. Also fever, anorexic or lethargy. Same thing um, if you've been around children. You know, they don't want to eat or if you've had a puppy, you take them there and get vaccines. They don't want to eat for the day. It's kind of the same situation. If you see that's usually normal, not a big deal. The ones we want to worry about and want to take into action are going to be your severe reactions. So this is your urticaria, and I have a picture here of that. It's just hives on the horse, um, purpura hemorrhagic colic, um, anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is definitely the worst. We don't want the horse to go into having issues breathing or for any sort. This is going to be constituted as an emergency that you would need to get the horse back up to the veterinarian for. Also, things to consider. Um, there are multiple vaccines at the same time may increase majority of these risks. Also, administration of a modified live and a killed vaccine in the same location may cause the adjuvants to inactivate the modified live vaccine. So be careful and know what you're giving if you're doing it at home. So vaccines and passive transfer. So um, we recommend vaccinating brood mares four to six weeks prior to foaling. This is to protect the mare and then also to maximize concentrations of immunogl immunoglobulins in the colostrum. So these are going to help with the full whenever they go in there. Um, it's not going to give the full feel, full immunity, but it is going to help them um, until they can build their own immune response. And then in which case we are going to have to revaccinate because these antibodies are only going to work for a certain amount of period of time. Again, there are complications and things like that with this, uh, but we won't go into that a lot it's for another discussion. Um, so for vaccine storage and handling. You want to keep a thermometer in the fridge, um, one that actually works, and you want to keep monitoring your fridge to make sure it's actually at that temperature. That way you have a double system here. Your fridge is saying reading 32, your thermometer should read 32. You also do not want to place it in the door or against the back of the fridge. Both of these are inadequate temperatures. You're opening the door, it's exposing it to heat, light, etc. The back of the fridge is extremely too cold. You don't want the vaccine to freeze. Um, this can definitely um, cause the integrity of your vaccine to be compromised. You also want to keep at the listed temperature on the vaccine label. So be sure whenever you do get a vaccine that you want to look at the vaccine label and actually make sure it stays at that desired temperature that the manufacturer has in place. So um, you also do not want to expose it to sunlight or overexpose it to light in the fridge. So most of the times we put vaccines in refrigerators with no lights. Um, or no open doors. You want it to be in a closed refrigerator. And whenever you send it home with the client or you pick up a vaccine from somewhere, you want to make sure that you don't just throw it on the dash of your truck. We have so many people that have come back and my horse got sick after I gave it the vaccine and I just don't understand what the deal is. And it turns out they just threw the vaccine on top of the dash of the truck with the ice pack. Ice pack melted, vaccine got hot, and by the time they got home that evening, it was no good anymore. It needs to stay at that adequate temperature. Um, so just keep that in mind whenever you're transporting or moving vaccines or things like that around or unpacking them even. If you get them mailed to your house, if you order them off of a website and things like that. So just something to consider. And if you have any of these issues, you want to make sure that you consult the manufacturer. If you suspect any shipping uh, heat, a refrigerator issue, or even a vaccine malfunction. So say they came in with a cooler and they kept it on ice while the horse still got sick. You still want to contact the manufacturer on that aspect and make sure that there's nothing going on with that batch in particular. And sometimes even, you know, you can get the manufacturer to help you with some of the vet bills and things. <clears throat> so I'm going to discuss in depth the core vaccines that we go over in equine. Um, so those cover Eastern and Western encephalomyelitis, rabies, tetanus, and West Nile virus. But we'll discuss a few other vaccines that are uh, recommended for equine and things like that. Um, but these are the core vaccines that every animal needs, whether this is your pasture pets or your actual show animal, whichever, any aspect of it from little donkeys, miniature ponies, whatever, everything needs these four vaccines. So we're going to talk about the Eastern and Western equine encephalitis, and I am going to touch base a little bit on the Venezuelan equine encephalitis virus as well. 
Um, so both of these, all, all of these cause encephalitis and or febrile disease in both horses and humans. Um, horses and humans are the dead end host. So it means that it was not potentially meant for them and they can't spread the disease further. Um, so once they get it, it only is going to affect that animal. And it's zoonotic. So that means that humans can actually get it. You're not gonna get it from a horse, um, but it is potential for you to get it from something else. So um, the virus circulates in nature between mosquitoes and wild animals generally. There's a primary cycle and a secondary cycle. We won't go into depth with that. It's a little bit more complicated, but just kind of understand that there are a few different cycles that it's potential to get to um, your horse and you. So equine encephalitis virus is majorly on the East Coast as far as the United States goes and is the most fatal. So about 90% fatality. Um, second is going to be the Venezuelan. This is not endemic to the United States, but it has been noted here. So people traveling, different things like that, and it is reportable. So something to think about, and whenever they test, they always make sure they test for this. If they suspect that your horse may have it, just because it is reportable and it's also zoonotic. So we don't want to make sure that the mosquitoes don't bite you and move along, uh, infecting other people. But it's the second deadliest. It's about 80% fatal if they end up with it, with certain strains. Western equine encephalitis virus is about 20 to 40% case fatality rate, so a lot lower. It's mainly on the West Coast, um, but then again, can be seen elsewhere. So it's mainly going to be symptoms and the animal is going to be a little sick. So as far as the vaccine, what we want to do here is we want to do an annual vaccination and four to six, four to six weeks prepartum. Um, also, if the animal's unvaccinated or we have an unknown history on an animal, we want to start over and do two doses, four weeks apart. It is also seasonal. So we want to think about this in a vector based. So vector would be the mosquito and um, also your ge geographical area. So if you're on the East Coast, you definitely want to vaccinate for Eastern encephalitis. Um, and if you're on the West Coast, you definitely want to do Western. So also you want to do it around spring because we all know it starts to rain, you have water accumulating, mosquitoes breeding ground, and then we have outbreaks of these diseases um, to keep up with. So, all right, and rabies. So a lot of people don't give the rabies vaccine, surprisingly. Um, it is mandatory for all small animals. Um, it, in some states, it is mandatory for large animals as well. Um, so also to keep in mind there, um, but it is highly recommended. Um, it's a neurological disease from a bite of an infected animal. Um, from a raccoon, skunks, fox, and bats are common ones that we see rabies in. It is rare, but it's fatal. So this is a reason why we'd want to vaccinate. So it's at the risk of your animal. You want to go unvaccinated or do you want to take the risk of actually losing your animal? And it's zoonotic, so you could potentially get it from your horse. And because it has a wide range of clinical signs from slobbering, aggression, um, different things like that, just not using their tongue. I mean, you think about it, horses that slobber, you could think about multiple different things here that why your horse would be slobbering. You have clover out in the field um, that they're slobbering and you have an abscess in their mouth, their teeth just got floated, different things like that. So um, you want to be aware and you may not see a bite from a bat on a horse, you know bites their back and you haven't been out there in a few days, it's already healed up. Well, and then your horse is acting strange. So um, just thinking about things like that, it's worth it to get the, you know, the $26 vaccine as opposed to losing your horse. Um, for the actual vaccine, um, we'll want to do that annually and then four to six, four to six weeks prepartum or prior to breeding for your mares. Um, another very good important one that we want to look at is going to be tetanus. Um, this is a fatal disease caused by a potent neurotoxin from anaerobic spore-forming bacterium called Clostridium tetani. Um, it is not contagious, but it is ubiquitous in the soil, and it's very hardy, so it's going to live there for years. Um, so if you have it in your area, you want to make sure you for sure vaccinate for this. Um, results from the puncture wounds lacerations, surgical incisions, umbilicus and folds, and then also reproductive tract postpartum. So you have difficulty with the foal if it's breech or something like that, and the mare gets a tear in her uh, along her vaginal wall, it puts her at risk for this. Um, and then for the vaccine, we want to do it annually. We want to do it four to six weeks prepartum. If they're unvaccinated or unknown history, you want to do two doses, four to six weeks apart. And then you also want to booster the vaccine at injury or at surgery. 
Now, if you have an injury, do want to discuss, there's a difference between tetanus toxoid and tetanus antitoxin. So if you bring your horse into the veterinarian and it has a huge laceration or a new puncture wound from um, a stick or something like that, they're going to give you the tetanus antitoxin. This is going to combat it, especially if it's unvaccinated. Um, but as far as the actual vaccine, you're looking at the tetanus toxoid. So don't get those two confused if you try to go pick something up on your own. Um, understand what you're getting. For the West Nile virus, this is the leading cause of encephalitis in horses and humans in the U.S. So again, another one transmitted by mosquitoes, 33% um, fatality rate and recovered horses are still going to exhibit residual effects. So you're going to have gait abnormalities. They're going to be unstable, more than likely not going to be able to ride this horse ever again. Um, so again, it's worth it to get the vaccine as opposed to losing your horse, especially if it's one that you're competing with um, that you will never probably be able to compete again with. Um, if you notice in the picture that I have down here, this is an actual horse that has West Nile virus. Um, it's unable to stand um, and use its back end. So you have different issues with this. Plus, not to mention, treatment is extremely expensive for this. And neurological diseases are not fun. They usually cause other secondary issues like sores and things like that on the horse, laminitis. Um, and then just altogether changes their entire personality most times. Um, as far as the vaccine, we want to give it annually, also four to six weeks prepartum. And again, it's another seasonal vaccine with those mosquitoes. You want to think about that. So in the spring, again, whenever you're looking at rain, puddles, things like that, mosquito breeding grounds, it's all vector based. Um, so you want to keep that into effect. And also for yourself, if you're in the area, you can also get West Nile. Some cities and states have uh, mandates in around springtime where they actually test mosquitoes and They've already found it again here in Texas not that long ago whenever we had all those big rains West Nile positive. So it is definitely around. Okay, some other risk-based vaccinations that I did want to talk about that are options here for you and your horse. So you have anthrax, botulism, equine herpes virus. Um, lots of people like to think of it as rhino. The equine influenza virus, um, equine viral arteritis, lepto, Potomac horse fever, rotaviral diarrhea, snake bite, and strangles. So um, a few of them that I do want to talk about in depth, the things that just kind of consider. So for botulism, if you're feeding any round bell hay or things like that, it's definitely something you think about getting the botulism vaccine. It's all about risk here. Um, you, round, you round bell something and it's from a spore, from a dead animal or something that gets bailed up in that bell and you're not able to look at it. Square bells are much easier to do that. You flake off a, a square bell, you're going to see that it has a dead rat in there, a dead skunk or something that those spores could potentially be living in. So it poses less of a risk. But if you're using round bell hay, botulism is a pretty bad disease and they usually don't recover from it very well. It's usually fatal. So it is definitely worth it to get the vaccine in that case. Um, if you're traveling and you're going around to different rodeos or jumping events, whatever your discipline may be, um, multiple vaccines are highly recommended. So the equine herpes virus um, is very contagious. So it's a good idea to go ahead and get that one along with equine influenza. Now, both of these aren't necessarily deadly. Um, they can have some severe adverse reactions and things like that um, as far as to the virus. But um, overall, uh, it's definitely worth it as opposed to doing the treatment. Lepto, if you're living in, and along with Potomac horse fever, if you're living in an area along a river or with tons of water exposed to wildlife, things like that, um, Potomac horse fever, more around mollusk and things like that, swampy-ish areas. Um, but if you're in an area like that, then you need to definitely consider both of those vaccines if your horse has access to any of that. Um, rotaviral diarrhea is more of a foal disease. Um, it affects the young and it's very fatal with them. So it's something to consider if you have it on your farm. Um, you, can you can test for that and see. And if so, it'd be something to consider. If you plan on going trail riding out in Arizona or Texas or somewhere where you're going to have rattlesnakes or exposed to that, you might consider the snake bite vaccine. Um, and then strangles, which I've talked about as an example throughout here. Um, it's a very controversial vaccine, um, but it definitely has its place. 
And like I said, the strangles lives on fomites. So it's very potential for it to go and you to pick it up off a bucket at a show or something like that. And I mean, why not go ahead and have that vaccine as opposed to have to have your horse quarantined for weeks and not be able to take it. And then they bust out underneath their um, mandible. And so it's just a big deal. Usually don't want to eat, lose weight. So just things to think about, but all of these are not part of your core vaccination, but depending on your um, discipline and what you're planning on doing with your horse, things like that, all vaccine protocols should be advised by a licensed veterinarian. So you should work this out with your vet and determine what's best for you and your horse on your situation. So where do we want to give a vaccine? So horses have some very important um, items in their neck. And we generally want to give vaccines in the neck. You don't want to give it anywhere else. Um, some people will give some injections in their rump. Again, you need to be careful. There are some very big nerves. If you hit, it's a big deal. Um, also, the risk of getting kicked. We definitely don't want to give vaccines there. Um, <clears throat> it's a harder area to manage if you do. And um, the neck's a little bit easier. It's on the side. So if they do get an abscess, it's easy to drain and easy to deal with. You can control their head and less risk of getting kicked or injured yourself. So um, whenever we look at this picture on the left, we have the nuchal ligament here that's along the top line of the horse. And then you have a space of muscle here. This is where we want to give the site of their IM injections or sub-Q injections or whichever. Most injections are all going to go IM nowadays, um, especially for equine since we don't eat them. Um, at least not here in the US. Then we have our spinal column, which is gonna run below that um, embedded in the muscle. So you wanna make sure that you're not going too high, not too low. And you definitely don't wanna go way too low. I've seen that before. People have accidentally injected them in the jugular vein or carotid artery. It's definitely an issue. These vaccines do not need to go in the bloodstream. That's not how they work. They work by getting in the muscle and then being um, taken up by the body's response and then distributed through the bloodstream not directly in the bloodstream. So be very careful there whenever you're trying to give vaccines, if you're doing it yourself. Um, I like to lay my hands on their shoulder and right in front of there, that gives you plenty of space. So you make sure you don't jab them in the shoulder, especially if horses jump or move, you're dealing with a young one. So just things to consider if you're planning on giving vaccines yourself. Otherwise, just watch the next time that you have um, your horse at the vet and they're giving those vaccines there. So what you're gonna to need to give a vaccine if you're wanting to do it yourself. Um, so you're gonna need a three cc syringe, a 20 by one and a half gauge needle. I have had clients that would like to use the 22 by one and a half gauge needle or by one inch. Um, the one inch is okay as well because you are going directly in the muscle and horses don't have that much sub tissue or fat there. Uh, but then again, just depending on your horse. Um, the 22 is a little bit harder to push it because it is a smaller needle. And then um, you're going to need your vaccine, of course. Um, so some of these vaccines um, that we talked about before, like the encephalitis and things like that, some of them you can get in a combination. So like this one that I have pictured here, this is encephalomyelitis, Eastern, Western, and Venezuelan. Um, it's a killed. Also contains tetanus and West Nile. So you get everything all in one shot. So this is less uh, stress for you and the horse. Um, and then some of them come in pre-packaged deals like I have pictured here. So it's already set to go. The vaccine's already in a syringe and are ready for you to go. And then the needle's in there. You just uncap the needle and sterilize it and put it on the syringe and go and vaccinate your horse. Another thing you want to consider here whenever you're going to give vaccines is that you want to make sure the neck is clean of debris. Um, we've had several other horses that have come in after owners have distributed their own vaccines after they went and rolled in a mud puddle or something like that and didn't bother to clean off the neck. Well, you introduce whenever you take any of that dirt, it goes in with the needle into the muscle and causes bacteria to grow in the muscle and then they have an abscess. So um, definitely something to consider there and keep in mind whenever you're wanting to do anything with your horse, make sure you want to do it in a clean aspect. Some people do prefer doing alcohol swabs over the area. Um, and then again, like we discussed in the beginning is be careful with how many vaccines you're wanting to give. If you're giving them individually, you don't have combination vaccines like these and um, things like that, then you know, you're going to have to 
be careful where you give them at and not in the same spot. You want to rotate sides on the neck, one on the left, one on the right. Make sure you document it as well, because if they do have an adverse reaction to one vaccine over another, um, you want to make sure that you know which vaccine they had a reaction to so you can prepare for that next time. And whether you want to not combine them, you want to try it just West Nile, just equine encephalitis, different things like that. So, and then also consider that rabies has to be given by a licensed veterinarian. So that's not something you can just go pick up from your veterinarian and take it home and give it. Um, so, all right, that's about all I have for you guys for vaccines. Again, if you have any questions or would like to know any more in-depth information about anything or any of the viruses or bacteria or different things like that that we covered today um, or have any questions, just shoot me an email or reach out to Morgan and we can work it out for you guys. All right. Have a great day.